Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to study the aldol reaction. You're going to ignore this stuff back here. That's for a different class. And the aldol reaction today is going to make this molecule called dibenzalacetone. But before we start, let's just look at aldol in general. It's one of the rare names that I actually like. Al, aldol, because it breaks down to things that are real. That right there, short for aldehyde. That right there, oh, well, aldehyde has a D in it, right? Jeez, Dr. Wicker, get with it. There we go. Uh, alcohol. Yeah, it's got both. The earliest aldols had both. I'm going to write that down. The earliest aldol reactions made products that had both aldehyde and alcohol. Oh man, sometimes I just like throwing new words at you. You ready for a new word? With a lot of vowels in a row. It's like the fin Finland, the country. You ever see their names? They had a hockey player, one of my favorite guys. Rutu. How many letters there? Six? Four of them were the letter U. <laughs> so reminds me of the Finns here. Uh, moiety. M O I E I T. Oh, and it's plural, so you get to throw another I in there. Moiety. It's, it's a word that means like unit. Okay. Moiety. Show that off to your friends when you get home. And we should uh, make that red and go blue. We have somebody in here that agrees. Go blue. <laughs> All right. So yeah, you need you need to start with an aldehyde or a ketone. Whoa, big little preview for you guys that are going to take the next course. You're going to learn how to use this program. So I don't know. Maybe watch as I go for some tips as you go. Those those uh, bonds were clearly too big, too long. Lecture purposes, two five is nice. I like my pie bonds a little better spread out. Uh, yeah, we're gonna modify everything. I'm gonna move everything down on me. All right, so I want a random aldehyde here. And anybody want to take a stab at the name of this aldehyde with one, two, three, four, five, six carbons? Want we'll to take a stab at name? Hexanal, very nice gas. And that was from one of my 140, 241 students who hasn't named an aldehyde in her life, probably. Maybe she has. All right. X and L. Bold and red. All right. And in this case, we'll react it with, um, okay, something like this. Bless you. There's another one. And that one is called formaldehyde. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Well, there is that. Yeah, and it makes you cry. It's called a lacrimator. Lacrimator, L A C H R. And yeah, it's not a nice chemical. No, it's nasty. And we would use a catalyst. I'm going to try to keep this generic. It's not our reaction. Cat. That's my short form for catalyst right there. Uh, acid or base. Today, uh, most of you know we're going to use a... Oh, wait. Maybe do not know. What are we using today as our catalyst? Okay, you want to re reword that and just talk about the catalyst portion and not the spectator? Hydroxide, thank you. I seem picky on that, I know, but it's for good reason. What happens here is there's two 
special H's here, special for reasons that you guys don't know, except for a couple of you maybe, who've had Orbo 2. These are called alpha H's. Alpha, the Greek letter A, H's. I'm gonna change that to symbol font. Live on alpha carbon. A carbon, says I. it's gonna be alpha. Uh, the carbon adjacent to a carbonyl. This is new for you. You didn't know there was such a special thing. Oh, wait, wait, there we go, symbol font. Seems a little small, doesn't it? Why did it make it so small? Copy, paste, save. Okay. Alpha H's. So did I miss one? Yeah. Lives on alpha carbon. Correct. So to be an alpha H, it's it's where you live. You got to be on a carbon one away from a carbon L. And the important fact here that we're going to exploit today is that the pKa of such an H is 20. You don't have to learn that for orgo one. You definitely have to learn it for orgo two. Uh, super script, subscript. There we go. pK is 20. This is important. So the base is going to take that H. And when all is said and done, it's going to look like this. Because you're not just taking H, what are you really taking? What are you really taking in an acid base reaction? Don't just say H. Proton, which is really H. Somebody else, I have a good team here. He said proton, she said H plus, and they're teammates. I like it. And there you go. So considering that in today's experiment, you're using hydroxide. This is somebody everybody should be able to think about. Even though it's a new pKa, doesn't change the fact that you're supposed to know something about acid-base chemistry, right? Hydroxide is a base that becomes what when it picks up a proton? Water. So if hydroxide was the catalyst, example, gracia. Example, uh, gracia. O, uh, HO negative. Formula that thinks that should be a, wow, I don't even know why I did that. There. So your side product would be plus, plus, computer's catching up, plus H2O. It's an acid base reaction, right? In the pair, in the pair, hydroxide and water, which one's the acid? Water. I need a pKa for the acid. Thank you. pKa equals 16. Okay. Acid base chemistry, always important. So in this equilibrium, uh, there's funny stuff going on there, isn't there? Wow. I had double plus sign. One's a random plus sign just hanging around for the ride. It's still a double plus sign. Look at you. Having fun today. Okay. So in the big scheme of things, uh, I'm going to pick an equilibrium arrow after this thing saves. And I'm going to go with this one. I'm going to drag it towards the favored side in this equilibrium. Which way do I drag? Top or bottom? But towards the top would say it's favoring the reactant. Towards the bottom would say it's favoring the products. Which one's the correct one here? Top. Look at that. I got an equilibrium arrow that does that. That's pretty sneaky. Okay. And you can actually tell me PKEQ for me, please. Drum roll. That might sound terrible on the video. Sorry about that. 
Back to me. I got two PKAs. 20 minus 16. And you get a four for that. Equals four. I don't know how that happened, but you know. Equals four. What's K E Q? K Q is 10 to the negative four. So you're saying, wait, Dr. Whitaker, we're doing a reaction that doesn't go towards products today. That's not good. You can, that's a good statement, actually. It's a good thought. What is actually going to happen is we're going to take advantage of this unfavorable equilibrium to do a synthesis. It's going to, something that was a disadvantage is a, is a huge advantage if you think of it this way. I've got these two molecules, right? Currently, they're in a ratio of, let's see, I get my math right. 100 with a comma and two zeros, three zeros. Oh yeah, what's that number? 100,000 to one. So, Mr. Obvious asked the question, what's this molecule surrounded by? <laughs> Don't say catalyst. There's always only small amounts of catalyst to start with. So don't say it's surrounded by catalyst. If you're in a room of 100,000 people and you're one guy and there's 100,000 girls, I uh, guess what's the well, happy guy? Uh, well, what do you say is in this room? You're surrounded by girls, right? So this molecule is surrounded by unreacted aldehyde. This is good. It's surrounded by unreacted aldehyde. So what's going to happen is the minus of that is very attracted to, I'm just going to grab this portion of our, no, this aldehyde. There we go. It's got a choice. It can attack this aldehyde because the carbon there is, You're gonna tell me what I'm trying to depict here. Slightly is on to me. Slightly positive on the carbonyl side. And slightly negative there. How come? How come? Oh, electronegativity, exactly. And similarly, we've got this other aldehyde. It, there's a lot of it around too, right? This thing's got nothing but aldehyde surrounding it. Two kinds. We only made one of these. There's still 100,000 of these. 99.999% is right there. You've got a choice. Uh, I don't know. My, Melba, my mind is messed up here. You've got a choice of attacking this carbon with your anion or attacking this carbon with your anion. Which one do you prefer as an anion? The formaldehyde. What's your reasoning? I like it. Uh, the other one has more carbon. The other one has more carbon. So as an approaching species here, did you use the B word? You used the B word. Somebody else guessed the B word. Don't tell them the B word. You used the right word. It's a good word. What was the word? Uh, bulky, bulky, yes. So it's bulkier when you got a carbon attached than when you don't, right? Which, what I'm trying to say, it's easier to get to the top one right here than the bottom one. And I'm going to get my fixed angles off just to show you a little depiction here. We're going to do an attack. And this one, you can get it from this angle this, or over from the right or the top a little bit. You can, you can be off angle a little bit. But once you start approaching this, look, it's running into carbons with that arrow right now. That stops it. Well, it slows it down. So that's another example of a blank hindrance. Steric hindrance. That's the magic words I'm going to write down here. This has less steric hindrance. 
And of course, this one has more steric hindrance. So the next part of the reaction goes like this. This is very attracted to the positive nature here. Now that would be five bonds to carbon, everybody. Can you have that? So you got to break one of the five bonds. What's the weakest bond? Weak bonds break before strong bonds. Thank you. Somebody said pi. And what's it becoming? Tell me, explain these arrows for me because arrows are a brand new deal for almost everybody in here. I'm just moving my lone pair so you can see it still. There you go. That's where the first arrow started. So with arrows, you always have to answer these questions. Where does the arrow start? It's always, you got to talk to me about a pair of electrons because that's what curved arrows are. The motion of a pair of electrons in a reaction mechanism so the give me the description of the pair of electrons where that arrow starts use the new stuff you've learned i need a description of the pair of electrons like what kind of electrons am i using lone pair on what carbon alpha you must know these things about curved arrows these words have to become what you do with your hands. So your arrows, you must know where they start, and it must be a pair of electrons. If arrows start in outer space, you don't get points for them. Okay? So you start at that pair of electrons. Tell me where that red arrow ends. Get used to talking organic chemistry. It's attacking a carbon. Tell me what that carbon is. A carbonyl carbon. And specifically, this would be an aldehyde carbon, right? And it makes what kind of a bond do you think? It's the only bond between that carbon and this carbon. So when I draw the product, what kind of bond is it going to be? Sigma. Yes. You're making a new sigma bond. That's called synthesis. It's exciting. If you're an organic chemist to do synthesis like me. All right. So we're going to have this combination give this result. Let's see. Let's try to figure out what it's going to look like. It's going to look like this with a new bond, not to H. That's, a, that's an exciting new bond there. Maybe it needs some color. Yeah. And it's going to be to this guy, right? Uh, what do I want to do? I want to extend this. It might not let me. That looks awful. It got rid of it. That's okay. Now, what happened to the carbonyl pi bond? It's gone. Now you're gonna. This thing's gonna make a mistake now because it likes filling octets for me. There's no H up there in this mechanism. There's no. You didn't show an H showing up there, did you? What did the lone pair become? Oops. What did the pair of pi electrons become? And I gave you the answer in my question by mistake. Yeah, welcome to my world. Okay. It became a lone pair which created an anion, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You do know this oxygen, in fact, has three lone pairs, correct? Or else it's not an O minus. In mechanisms, I only need lone pairs that you're going to use. It's the only lone pairs I ever need to see in a mechanism. Lone pairs that you're going to use. Because it's almost time for that. To make an aldol. I've got half of the name already, don't I? What part is that? Right there. Al. This is the conjugate blank of the alcohol, what? Conjugate base of the alcohol. What's this word, uh, short, what's this the short form for again? Cat, what's it mean? No, uh, 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 uh. Somebody said cation, it does not mean cation. When I write cat, it always means catalyst. 
a catalyst does not get used up in a reaction. You got to read that very carefully. The up word, just as important as the used word. It gets used, but then it gets regenerated. So right now you got to give me a step that regenerates the catalyst and generates an alcohol. Well, don't forget your catalyst was hydroxide and I'm gonna show its mechanism right now, right here. Cause in an acid base reaction, there's a mechanism too. There's hydroxide, that was my example, right? There's my, no, I don't need to draw lone pairs ever, do I? I got a lone pair right now. Yeah, and what did I say about lone pairs? That thing should have three lone pairs. It lost its H, just being obstreperous, that's all. Seems like a vocab day, doesn't it? All right, you got a minus on there. That's hydroxide, isn't it? Acid base, describe this arrow. Where did the uh, electrons start and where did they end? Lone pair on hydroxide, the start, where did it end? Use your new letter. Alpha hydrogen. Yes. All right, now you need a second arrow because that would be two bonds to hydrogen. Is that legal? Heck no. Describe this arrow to me. What it's starting where? I know it's a small arrow. You want to see a blow up? This arrow starts on what? What pair of electrons? Is my box in the way? Do I need to get rid of my box? It's confusing you. This, that's what I wanted to hear. It didn't, it didn't block her from seeing it starts at the sigma bond. And where does it end? Use your new letter. On the alpha carbon as a lone pair, creating a anion formal charge. It's good. That's how we should think about chemistry. I know words aren't the best for everybody, but they do help you learn. Okay, and we're going to do that step right now. Uh, we made water, right? I need to show water was its bond. So here's going to be water. You got your O. You got your H. Where did it come from? Right here. What kind of reaction is this? Grab H. Lone pair. Sorry, sigma becomes lone pair. Isn't that right? So that second arrow. And hello. Why are you not? Okay, this chem draw is not quite like my chem draw. There we go. And we can draw the product, which we never drew. The promised aldol product. Here it is. That's not an O minus anymore. It's a, it's what the computer gave me before, isn't it? Yeah. And let's make it all black. And then go right there for what color is that? Blue. What color is this? Red. Nice name, huh? And what letter? That goes this right here, doesn't it? And if that's alpha, describe the position of the alcohol. Mm, beta question mark, yes. Beta question mark should become beta with certainty, young man, because it's correct. Okay. And there we have it. I'm just going to tidy it up so it looks a little better. It's nice. Okay, uh, I do want to note before we move on. There you go. PKA uh, at the end isn't really a big deal. It's gone from 16 to 17, right? That's not a big driving force. Okay. The driving force is here. Driving force. What does it mean when a chemist says driving force? They seem to say it a lot, don't they? 
it's what makes things work, everybody. Driving force means go, right? So green. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do they mean when they say driving force? Trying to like entice the electrons to like uh, want to seek a more stable place. I like the way he said that. Enticing the electrons to seek a more stable place. That's, I, that was those were his exact words. Yeah, so a favorable situation that will uh, pull things towards where you want to go. And we have an unfavorable situation here. We agreed, right? But as soon as this happens, this reaction is not going backwards. I would like to point out this one also back and forth, but pretty much uh, straight up equilibrium with the numbers that close, right? The numbers almost match, right? So that's not an equilibrium that's a problem. This one is not a problem after we re realize that by doing this reaction, you're removing the anion from the first equilibrium. What does Mr. Le Chatelier say about that? If you remove this product from the first equilibrium, what must you do to compensate? Make more. That draws this equilibrium towards making a new anion. Okay? And then it gets removed again from the equilibrium as soon as it reacts. You got to make more. Okay? They make some more and it draws out. So basically, everything ends up here in a ratio of, uh, well, I don't know, 100,000 to one from here to here. Or maybe you got 100,000 of these left over and a mole of these. What's a mole compared to 100,000? Infinite. Okay? It's like 100,000 is like zero. So don't use infinite. That's for extreme hyperbole. Okay, so yeah, if I have a mole of product here and only 100,000 of these unreacted aldehydes and these unreacted aldehydes, like 100% yeah, reaction. A mole compared to 100,000 is 100% to zero. Okay, and we've got the aldol reaction product. I'm gonna write that down right here. This video is not gonna go much longer. Aldol reaction product. From now on, I'm going to call it the old ARP. All right, I'll do all reaction time. I'm not 60 yet, but I'm getting close. All right, so what do we got? Aldol reaction product. Now, with the aldol reaction product, you can make it undergo what's called a condensation. That's what you're going to do today. And we've done half the condensation now. Remember, condensation in the biology term. What do they say? They use two words instead. Dehydration. Dehydration synthesis. We've done the synthesis. I told you they named it backwards, or I mentioned that in class. The dehydration's next. So if heat is present, dehydration will occur as well. If heat is present, then dehydration of the ARP will yield a condensation product. Aldol condensation product. I should write it down. Aldol condensation product, also known as uh, ACP. Okay, so let's do that over here. This guy's always in the way. Do you even see him up there? There you do. Yep, talking in the third person. Here we go. So you still have your base, right? Because the other product here was, what was the other product? Hydroxide. I already had a hydroxide. I didn't have to redraw it, did I? Yeah. yeah. There you go. And you'll see a lot of videos and notes, and I, I don't want you getting confused because when I when I regenerate my product, I, I typically write this too. It's just it's silly. I admit it's silly, but it's also 
a good reminder. What, what animal says meow? Cat. What's cat stand for in this course? Catalyst. The catalyst is back, isn't it? The cat came back. You've got to watch the video. Just Google the cat came back. It's hilarious. It's a, it's a cartoon. It's, it's just funny. Okay. So we got the meow on the cat and the cat's back and he can do some stuff, you know, cats. Cats get easily bored. They want to do stuff when, when they want to do stuff. All right. So what's special about this carbon again? Right here. Alpha, well, why is it special? PK20, yeah. And I can grab that H again. Watch uh, watch what happens too. That might be a little on the curvy side. I wanted to reach over the hydroxide. Eh, not so much. I wanted that first one, didn't I? Okay, yeah, get it out of there. How do you like that? Lone pair is grabbing the H, correct? Can I say it that way? And then the sigma bond becomes, you tell me when I do this. It's going in between those two carbons. There's already a bond there and you are making a second one. That's what that arrow means, the little arrow. Tell me what kind of bond you just made. Hi. Now you can't have an octet violation on the carbon, so meow meow. Why are you saying meow meow? What's leaving? The catalyst is coming back. It's a catalyst again down here. This is the second time it's been a catalyst. Meow meow. You thought it was an accident. Yeah, you know, number two. And your uh, ACP doesn't have the hydroxide, does it? And doesn't have the hydrogen, does it? What does it have from alpha to beta? Alpha to beta. Do I have a beta somewhere? Yeah. And clean it up a little bit. Yeah, sure. And somebody said. Eh, I wish they said it a different way. Instead of saying double bond, what should you say? Add a pi right there. And so ACP, that's the ACP, isn't it? And ARP, uh, I must have the caps on. So do we have an ARP somewhere? Yeah, we do. Describe the ARP. A beta hydroxy aldehyde. And that needs to be a beta. Simple font. Isn't that a good description? Beta hydroxy aldehyde. Where's the hydroxy? Beta to the aldehyde. Good name. Now describe the aldehyde down here. ACP, not beta hydroxy. Alpha, beta, unsaturated. Oh, that's a fancy word, isn't it? What does unsaturated mean? You can dissolve more in the solution, right? What? No, no, not that unsaturated. But the context is similar. A saturated solution has as much solute dissolved as possible. A saturated formula has as much hydrogen as possible. When you make a pi bond, you sacrifice two hydrogens. You are unsaturated now because you don't have as many H's as possible in your formula. You know that you know the saturated formula, CNH2N plus two, right? Yeah. That was in chapter two, uh, the introduction. Yes, it was, wasn't it? Good memory. 
Okay, I think that's a good stopping point here. I'm going to add one comment. Uh, this whole discussion, whole, dude, not that whole, whole discussion also works for ketones instead of aldehydes. So I'm going to copy the two descriptions of the product. Didn't I have a description of the ARP? I did, didn't I? I copied it, but I moved it and not, I didn't copy it. Man. Well, it's good review. I had a description and it disappeared. What did I have in the description? Beta hydroxy aldehyde. Beta hydroxy is the ARP, right? So how's that going to change in my new, this whole discussion of this? I'm not, I can't keep this here. ARP, Eldol reaction product will not be, obviously won't be a beta hydroxy aldehyde if you started with a ketone. What do you got? Ketone. So the name Aldol doesn't work anymore, right? Just remember, the name is historical. Ketones and aldehydes have very similar chemistry. They do almost always the same thing. And ACP, uh, alpha beta unsaturated ketone, right? All right, uh, now I got some solution labels for our experiment today. Maybe we talk about those before we go to a new video. My labels didn't end up being very nice. I changed font size upstairs. So today we're going to use acetone. I don't know why it's being so mean to me. That's a change, the amount of acetone. We don't need these labels at all. In your book, it says 29. We accidentally used 30 one semester and the whole class got better results. That's called serendipity when this happens. Uh, we're just sticking with 30 from now on. Okay. It's the excess reactant anyway. So does it matter if you change its amount slightly by increasing it? Is that going to change any calculations for theoretical yield, which you're going to watch videos on because students always hate it? But I know this, and we made like two or three videos. You got to watch about theoretical yield and percent yield because we calculate them every time for every reaction we ever do, and it finally got real. And then students glaze over it. I don't understand percent yield. That's what they do. Guys, it's finally becoming real. You, this is the time to start understanding it. You're using it. And you're doing a reaction and telling me how the percent yield worked out. Okay, so review that, please. Okay, so we made a small change on acetone. I'm getting rid of that. Benzaldehyde, I didn't change. 80 microliters, very small amounts today. I made a fresh catalyst solution. I have a witness. She was, she was here watching me make it this morning. Uh, I doubled this recipe, but that doesn't matter. The ratio is what's important. So later today, I'm going to do you a favor. Uh, you've got to calculate for your report form how much, how many grams of sodium hydroxide you used. Wow. Well, here's the recipe for me making the solution, and you used in your in your notebook how many milliliters of this catalyst solution. It's in your data table right now. One milliliter times 0 0.4 grams hydroxide for every seven milliliters. Where did I get the seven from? I think you can figure it out. The total volume of the stock solution. And in that, there was 0.4. I used a fraction of it, a one seventh fraction. And I'm going to get, I'm going to get a KEQ. I'm going to get an equals. 
And somebody worked it out for me. What you got? 0.4 over 7. Uh, 0 0.057 grams hydroxide. Uh, really, it's sodium hydroxide. You can't ignore the spectator when you're weighing it out of a bottle, right? Sodium was part of that. I weighed out 0.4 grams of sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to just sneak the word sodium above here. You cross it off. You want to pretend it's not. There you go. So that's just a, a freebie. So that's how many grams of sodium hydroxide you are using. Oh, yeah, it's the end of our video.